Champs. Do you know what time it is? It's time to turn down this bagpipe music and review the final Star Wars movie that is remaining to be reviewed except for all of the other Star Wars movies that are spin-offs that are not official you know what I mean it's time to review the rise of Skywalker now my lovely lovely imps I have been on a long Star Wars arc when I was a kid I really liked Star Wars and when I grew older I started to hate Star Wars and in fact it was the Disney trilogy that made me hate Star Wars because it was so ubiquitous and annoying and low quality that I just couldn't stand it anymore and this movie the rise of Skywalker was the movie that almost permanently killed my love of Star Wars. The Rise of Skywalker is one of the worst movies that I have ever seen. Not just easily the worst Star Wars movie, but one of the worst movies that I've ever seen in my entire life. And it is actually shocking how bad this movie is. I just rewatched it the other day. And upon my second viewing, I actually discovered things that I didn't even notice the first time through that are f so phenomenally stupid that I can't even believe that it was put to film. Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker is a creative war crime. It is a true failure of epic proportions. And what's even worse is that it's one of the most expensive artistic failures of all time. Um, let's just see, can I just bring up real quick, uh, The Rise of Skywalker had a budget of approximately it's estimated at somewhere between 275 to 416 million dollars. Half a billion dollars. Now, unfortunately, they made all of that money back and more. The movie pulled in over a billion dollars in the box office. However, just because you make a whole bunch of money on one movie does not actually mean that it is good in the long run, even for a studio. Because Rise of Skywalker, I believe, permanently damaged the legacy of Star Wars in a genuinely uh, painful way. Let's talk about that, okay? As you all know, in my reviews of Star Wars movies, uh, I tend to talk about the social environment, the political environment, and the historical aspects of the films in addition to reviewing the movie itself. The original trilogy, one of the most famous, if not the most famous sci-fi series of all time. Uh, sci-fi, it's science fantasy, but still, it counts as sci-fi. Star Wars uh, defined a generation of nerds, not just one generation, multiple generations of nerds. Even just the original trilogy had such a lasting impact that nerds and their grand nerd children were all hooked on the original trilogy. They were just so aesthetic. They were so cool. They had so much, they had just so much vibe, okay? that they, it's almost, it's almost impossible to fully grasp how impactful the original trilogy of Star Wars was. And then of course, we got the prequel trilogy. And I reviewed the prequel trilogy. If you wanna see all of my Star Wars reviews, all of my Star Wars reviews are being posted on my channel. Just search Demon Mama Star Wars and you'll find them all, I assure you. Uh, the prequel movies were obviously 
uh, very um, polarizing films. They were very flawed films. However, I will point out that despite all of the flaws of the prequel trilogy, the prequel trilogy not only made money, but also added to the legacy of Star Wars. Even though the prequel movies have some really stupid stuff in them, I absolutely ragged on uh, Attack of the Clones, for example, for being a meandering, confusing, and poorly written movie. Regardless of that, there was so much good stuff in the prequel trilogies that it led to people actually lo loving them nonetheless. It's this kind of thing. There's a lot of media that isn't very good that people love nonetheless. An example of this is basically the entirety of a, of like a, uh, a game series like Kingdom Hearts, okay? Kingdom Hearts, the first one was fantastic, if cheesy. The second one was incomprehensible, but mechanically, gameplay-wise, good. And the later Kingdom Hearts have been confusing, nonsensical, borderline incoherent. And nonetheless, because they are made with so much heart and because there's so much good stuff in them, people love it anyways. Um, because they were trying something. And that there's something to latch onto there that makes people love it. The Kingdom Hearts games were hugely popular and also very successful, even though there's also a lot of reasons to make fun of them. The same thing applies to the trilogies, the or, or the prequel trilogy. The prequel trilogy was goofy, cheesy, kind of stupid at times, but it was doing something completely and utterly different than what had been done before. It really tried. Their, the heart was in it, and there was so much to like about them. Everybody loves the battle droids. Everybody loves the different ships. Everybody likes all the locations that they went to, with a few exceptions. Um, all of the different alien races, even the goofy stuff, like De Dexter Jetster's 1950s diner. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so um, the prequel trilogies, uh, basically, um, even though they had a lot of problems, they still inspired a lot of love. But Rise of Skywalker and the sequel trilogy can do no such thing. Even though Rise of Skywalker made half a, half a billion dollars in profit, which is amazing and incredible, congratulations to Disney Corporation for making even more money, uh, Rise of Skywalker was so incoherent, so soulless, so cowardly and spineless and empty, and in addition, it failed to tie the other two movies together so badly that there's basically nowhere that they can go uh, for an entire trilogy. The sequel trilogy slot was completely and utterly destroyed. And that's a pretty big thing to mess up. Because while it is true, you can go back in time and you can create more prequel stuff, and you can, uh, and you can, you know, make spin-offs that happen at the same time, but ignore it. I mean, God knows, I really love Star Wars Andor. Star Wars Andor is the thing that made me like Star Wars again after all of this other crap. But that sequel slot is taken forever. The universe is going to have to grapple with the fact especially because Disney will never uncanon these movies, that these three movies were a giant waste of potential and anything that wants to move forward in time instead of going backwards in time will forever be shackled to the legacy of these films. And the prequels did not do that. Uh, none of the spin-off movies did that. None of the flops there's been a lot of Star Wars flops, okay? There's been a lot of bad spinoffs. There's been a lot of bad media that's come out of Star Wars over the years. And none of them managed to have the same level of failure that the, the sequels, specifically Rise of Skywalker, managed to accomplish. Despite the financial success, on a spiritual level, it was a, a big wound, okay? Now, there's a lot 
that I could say about the overall political emptiness of the sequel trilogy. And in fact, I already have. I mentioned that The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, that both of these films were notably politically sterile, that there is just nothing. The met, the polit you can't extract almost any sort of political message from these movies, which is weird because the original Star Wars movies, the original OG trilogy, they weren't super politically deep, but they had a lot of politics in them. They were movies about political terrorists. They were about rebels disobeying the law and engaging in acts of terrorism against an overwhelming imperial state. That is a very politically charged stance. And of course, the prequel trilogies were crazy political. The prequels, the politics is the best part of the prequel trilogies, like it or not, whether you hate it or like it, the prequel trilogy is super political and I love that part of it. But this, the sequel trilogy is completely and utterly empty. There is nothing. You can't really pull anything from it. It's not really a story about people rebelling against an overwhelming uh, imperial presence because there isn't an overwhelming imperial presence. They're fighting a weird cult of Nazi guys. Um, and those Nazi guys have like a small victory, but then that ends up still being a fight between two tiny factions and they don't really do anything with that. So there's not really much politics to be pulled from it. The characters aren't particularly politically motivated and you never get to see what their beliefs are with regard to politics. They're just very empty. But guys, Rise of Skywalker takes this to the next level to such a degree that it, it like does brain damage to you, okay? Rise of Skywalker is not just politically empty, it's like politically offensive, okay? And we're going to get into all the details about that, but I just need to be clear. Not even the political shock jockeys, the, the, the woke, go woke, go broke people, they couldn't even manage to muster a anti-SJW, anti-whatever message about this movie because it didn't make enough sense for them to actually do that. You don't see move, you don't see videos on YouTube about how the rise of Skywalker is super, uh, is super, super woke or whatever. It's all about The Last Jedi and The Force Awakens. The Rise of Skywalker is so soulless that even the dudes whose entire job it is to make up stupid shit to get mad at couldn't even do that properly. The cultural impact of this movie is nothing. And I mean that. It is a, it, the, the, the needle didn't even jut, judder. It didn't even shiver. Just nothing. No one will remember it. No one gives a shit about it. It didn't say anything. It didn't even, ge the only discourse that it generated was, wow, did that movie suck or what? Cause boy, did this movie fucking suck. Okay, it is so bad. Okay, let's start. Let's just get right into it. The movie opens with a ugly fight scene in a burning forest. Uh, Kylo Ren is swinging his lightsaber around and grunting, ah, ah, and he's cutting random people in half. And uh, the person, one of the people that I watched the movie with, one of my lovely uh, friends and chatters, uh, Gay Fesh and mods and everything, and, and Time Stamper, Gay Fesh is, is great. Uh, I watched it with Gayfesh, and Gayfesh said, oh, don't worry, Kylo Ren's a good guy now because those guys were white nationalists. And as far as, as far as you could tell, they could have been white nationalists. You literally never know who he's killing. He's just cutting random people in half in the middle of a forest. The camera lifts up into the sky and just goes somewhere else. And never again do you see the forest, never again do you see the people that he's fighting. It is a literally a contextless, shitty looking action scene that has no consequence whatsoever. And that is the opening shot of the movie. I, not, I don't even know how, like, what a prophetic opening to the film, okay? Just 
opens up on something that means nothing. Op the, the opening shot of your movie is so fucking important. I don't even know, like, it sets the tone for the rest of the film. It's supposed to introduce characters that matter. It's supposed to say something. You can't just open the, the, this, the movie with nothing, or apparently you can, but they did. Literally shot opening of nothing. And then I'm trying to remember exactly what happens immediately next. Uh, the next thing that happens is, oh yes, it cuts to Ray. I remember now. Uh, uh, Ray, okay? So Ray is running around in the woods, gasping. She's like, <laughs> and there's that little ball. Remember the ball, guys? Guys, remember the ball? I made fun of this in the prequels because uh, in, in the original trilogy, there's this tiny little ball. It's like a training ball or something. It's like a ball that shoots a little stun dart. And, uh, and you know, uh, Obi-Wan is making Luke practice with the ball. The ball shoots the little stun dart and he's blocking it, right? And this ball has been retroactively and now forward uh, brought forward as like the canonical Jedi training device, which apparently for some reason Han Solo had like a canonical Jedi training device just kicking around on his ship, which is stupid, okay? And I made fun of that in the prequels, but it's twice as stupid now. It makes even less sense for it to show up in the sequels because everybody already knows that it was done before and the, the Jedi have been completely and utterly obliterated and so they just decide to d design the exact same technology again, but for some reason it's all banged up, like somebody's been used. It makes no sense, okay? She's running around in the woods and she's fighting with the ball, okay? And a bunch of dumb shit happens that doesn't have really any impact. Basically, she gets a stomach ache from the force. She's like, ooh, something feels off. And this is where what, one of the stupidest things, and I didn't even realize this at first. It was actually big shout out uh, big shout out to Doe, my partner, who many of you know, uh, for pointing this out to me. So here's what happens. Um, she's got Luke's lightsaber, right? She's practicing with Luke's lightsaber. And then she hands Luke's lightsaber to Leia because she gets a tummy ache and she's like, oh, the force, I can't, I'm, I'm not worthy. I can't do the training because I'm getting distracted by, the, by something bad in the force. Please take back Luke's lightsaber. I don't deserve it. Except there's a problem. There's two problems. But the first problem, Luke's lightsaber got destroyed at the, literally in the, the last scene of the, or not the last, not the completely last scene, but in one of the last scenes of the, the, the Jedi, of the, of the last Jedi. And I completely forgot that that even happened. There's a, literally a scene where, where Rey and, and Kylo Ren are going like this and Luke's lightsaber gets torn to bits. It gets pulverized. There's nothing left of Luke's lightsaber. And it's back in perfect condition, no explanation. It's just back again at the beginning of Rise of Skywalker. And I was just like, huh? And at first I just forgot that that actually happened at the end of the movie. And then Doe and Gayfesh pointed out, wait a minute, how did that happen? And they never explain it. And here's where it gets even stupider, as if it couldn't get more stupid than that. Ray hands the lightsaber to Leia and Leia says, you sure you don't want this kid? And she goes, I'm not ready for it. I, there's, I'm just, I, I can't focus. There's, I'm not, I don't, I'm not worthy of the sword yet. And then she walks over and has a conversation with Poe and Finn. And less than three minutes later on the screen, she walks back over and Leia gives her the lightsaber back again and says, you do deserve this, kid. And that is right there. The movie could have ended right there and it would have made ex the exact, like perfect sense, okay? 
uh, the movie would have summed up its entire purpose right then and there, which is that something happens and then is immediately undone within seconds. The entire the entire film of Rise of Skywalker is something happens and then something undoes the thing that happens. Nothing matters. Not one thing matters. I don't deserve this lightsaber. Five seconds later, yes you do. Take it back. And not just that, but keep in mind that if you zoom out and look at the lightsaber through the entire rest of the series, she gives, Maz Kanata gives her the lightsaber and she says, I don't deserve this. Then she gives the lightsaber to Luke. Luke throws the lightsaber away. And then she goes and picks the lightsaber back up. Then she get, then the lightsaber gets destroyed and somehow comes back together. She hands the lightsaber to Leia. Leia gives the lightsaber back to her. And again, this is jumping forward. I'm gonna jump forward. Later in Rise of Skywalker, she tries to throw the lightsaber away again. I'm not kidding you, this actually happens later in the movie. She tries to throw it away again, but Luke's force ghost catches it and throws it back at her. I could not even believe how stupid it was. This fucking lightsaber hot potato is one of the absolute dumbest things I've ever seen in any film series. It is so much more stupid than the prequels, it's not even funny. There is nothing this stupid in the prequels. Nothing. Not one thing in the prequels is as dumb as the lightsaber hot potato that happens across these movies. Just back and forth and back and forth and none of it means anything. It doesn't mean anything. There's nothing communicated at all. It is just them tossing a lightsaber back and forth because it looks dramatic. And let me tell you, that is the empty aesthetics quote unquote, of the Star Wars sequels is one of the most offensive things of all. Everything happens just because it kind of looks dramatic. Basically the entire thing. So, so, so stupid. But there's more. There's more stupid crap. In fact, one of the stupidest things I've seen in any movie ever, not just Star Wars, the lightsaber thing is the stupidest Star Wars specific thing, but I'm about to tell you about the stupidest thing I've ever seen, okay? So the next major scene in the movie is they go to this big festival and credit, credit to the the uh, costume team, credit to the set work team, the festival that they go to, all of the little dudes look great. There's these little babies that look cute, these little baby aliens that are like, blah, blah, blah. And they have a really awkward line. One of the babies like looks directly at the camera and goes, what's your last name, lady? And she's like, oh, I don't have one. Terrible writing, embarrassing. Embarrassing, but whatever. It happens and it's over in like two seconds. They have a big festival with a bunch of cool looking things. And then we receive information that there is a secret special magical item uh, on the planet that Luke was looking for like 15 years ago. And he was looking for this item because it was supposed to help him with something, which we don't know what it is that he's that he needs it for. Uh, and he was looking for it like 15 years ago and Lando was helping him look for it. And apparently Lando was just hanging out on this planet for 15 years and they never found it. Despite the fact that they knew exactly where the item was supposed to be, it was, it, they're referencing, it was, it belonged to some random guy that we've never heard of before whose ship is crashed a few miles away. And the, the ship was crashed for like 15 years, but for some reason, no one has touched the crashed ship in 15 years. Nobody, even though they're on a desert planet where there is definitely scavengers, nobody's touched it. I think there's, I think they even show that there's Jawas there who are scavengers, but regardless, nobody's touched it, even though it's in plain sight, sitting on the top of a rock mountain, they never went to look there. 
Apparently they were searching super hard for it, but Luke just forgot about it. So they go to this place where, where the magical item is supposed to be. This is the first MacGuffin. Now something we're going to discover in this film is that there is like three nested matryoshka dolls of MacGuffins. There's a MacGuffin that leads to a MacGuffin that leads to a MacGuffin. It is inexcusable and pathetic, okay? Isn't Ray literally a scavenger? Yes, she is, but that doesn't matter. So they're going to go uh, to this untouched 15-year-old super secret magical uh, uh, item that's being carried on an old ship that's been sitting there forever. And while they're going there, they get attacked by stormtroopers. And this, this is... It's important that you guys follow this really closely, okay? I really need you to like, um, I really need you to like, listen to this, okay? The stormtroopers attack. Some of the stormtroopers have a jetpack. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, not to be a little bit of a nerd emoji, a uh, fucking bazinga ass nerd emoji, uh, uh, whatever right now, not to be a Wikipedia, but uh, jetpack troopers have existed since the Clone Wars at the earliest, like they were commonplace. Jetpack troopers have existed as a part of the regular army of the stormtroopers, which Rey and Finn are have been fighting now for a couple of movies. And remember, Finn was a stormtrooper. He knows about the technology in the Empire. So canonically, even in the Disney canon, jetpack troopers have been around forever. And this of course yielded one of the stupidest lines in movie history, which is, they fly now? Everybody knows that Finn says, they fly now? But did you know that three separate people say they fly now? It's not actually just Finn. They had to say it three times. Finn goes, they fly now? And then Poe goes, they fly now. And then C-3PO or somebody goes, they fly now. I just can't, I couldn't even, the soy levels were so off the chart. Everybody makes fun of the first part. Oh, 3PO said it first. Oh, I didn't even realize that. Sorry, 3PO was the one who said it first. Three people repeat that line. That's how awesome and funny they thought that line was. But it gets even stupider. I know everybody memes on that line, but what is about to happen in the film is even more stupid than that line. And I really wish that more people would pick on this part. They're running away on speeders and the jetpack troopers are chasing them, okay? And one of the jetpack troopers blows up their ship. Oh, shit! Our speeder got blown up! And they all fall into a sand pit. Oh no, we're in quicksand, guys! Help! They made, it, they don't, it doesn't even look like quicksand. It looks like Orbeez. You guys know what Orbeez are? Orbeez? I can't believe I'm doing a, a boomerism by bringing up Orbeez. These. They look like these. They look like these. Orbeez. Okay? Anyway, uh, they land in a quicksand pile and they're like, oh no, oh my God, oh, help. And then Finn says this. Finn looks at Ray and goes, Ray, I never got the chance to tell you. <gasps> and then he sinks into the, into the quicksand, okay? And I need you to remember that, okay? Because they really, really wanted you to remember that. In fact, they bring it up two other times in the movie. And we'll get to what actually happens with it, okay? Ah, Ray, I never got to tell you, oop! So. Two seconds later, oh, it's revealed! They weren't in a sand pit. Actually, that sand pit secretly falls into a cave. Wow, how convenient. So they fall through the sand pit for some reason into a cave. And in this cave, they discover a, a skeleton. I mean like a, like a Skyrim ass, like video game skeleton going like this. Like a, like a environmental storytelling skeleton. And this skeleton is holding the MacGuffin. 
one of the stupidest, most idiotic writing in any movie I've ever seen. A magical, highly relevant item, which I will explain what it does, just happens to be in the bottom of a sand pit that they were running away from where they were supposed to be looking for it. They got blown up and they just happened to fall into a sand pit where a random skeleton is holding on to the magical, highly plot relevant item in the bottom of a, of a random pit. I couldn't even believe it when I saw this. When I saw this, the original, the first time I saw this movie, I just, I, 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 I was, my brain like short circuited. I'm like, did they seriously just have the MacGuffin be on a random environmental storytelling skeleton that's in the bottom of a sand pit? How the fuck does anybody write that? And it, no, people are saying that this is like a dungeon master level storytelling. This is worse. I have never had a D&D &D like amateur writer write something this bad. It's so stupid. I couldn't even believe it. It's like, it's worse writing than like the room. The room is more coherent than that. It makes no fucking sense. It's not even, it's, it's like uh, not even video games do it that bad. Un it, it was unbelievable to me. Genuinely unbelievable. But don't worry. You don't have time to think about it, okay? You don't have time to think about it because uh, uh, <laughs> because they have to get out of the cave and they try to get out of the cave, but guess what? Something happens. That's right. There's a snake. So they try to leave the cave and there's a snake sitting in front of the exit to the cave. And the snake is going, <sighs> look at me. I got a snake tongue. That's what the snake does, okay? And they're about to blast the snake, okay? They're like, oh no, a snake, oh God! Okay, and then, and then Ray goes, no, no, don't shoot the snake. For some reason, Ray just says, don't shoot the snake. And then Finn, Finn is like, I wanna shoot the snake. And Poe's like, yeah, I'm with him, I wanna shoot the snake. And then Ray's like, no, don't. And then Finn goes, okay, don't shoot the snake. And you don't really have any idea why not. And she goes, hold on, Snakey. Snakey, hold on. And she goes close to the snake and she steps over the snake's body. This is, it's not visible, okay? It's only visible from the perspective of the camera. Like not to be all cinema sins and annoying and nitpicky, but she can't see what's about to happen. Only the camera can. She, step, she steps over the snake and we see the snake has a cut. Oh no, the snake has a cut on its side. And she goes, it's okay, snake. And then she puts her hands out like this and she heals the snake. And then the snake goes and slithers away. And then they climb out of the cave. I don't even know how am I supposed to, what am I supposed to say besides reporting to you what happens in this stupid movie? Not only does it not make sense from a camera angle, like that she can't even see the wound, she just randomly thinks, let me heal the snake, an ability that has never actually been, a, and it's so dumb too, because later in the movie, they actually have an opportunity to introduce the force healing. But for some reason, they thought it was necessary to have her randomly under no circumstances when they could have just blasted the snake if they really wanted to. It's a hostile, mean snake that's about to bite them, but there's no lesson. There's no lesson. It's not about being kind to animals because they blast a bunch of animals later on in the film anyway. So it's not about being kind to animals. It's not about patience. It's just help. We've never used healing before. Let's introduce it now. Later on in the film, Kylo Ren gets injured in a in a emotionally tense lightsaber battle and Rey uses the healing to heal him. 
it would have made sense to just introduce the healing then. Because as we all know, it's established canon in the Star Wars universe that sometimes intense emotional situations can open people up to the force. So I have no idea why the random snake healing scene was necessary when they already had a scene where she could have used the healing. Just, oh God, it's so dumb. Okay, so I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, after this, after this, what happens? Ah, yes, the dumbest thing, the next dumbest thing that I can imagine. So they get the magical MacGuffin, okay, right? And we introduce MacGuffin number two. The MacGuffin that they got is a magical Sith knife, okay? And the Sith knife has Sith language written on it. And the Sith language, C-3PO can read it, except he can't tell them what it says because apparently there was a secret programming that was put in during uh, the time of the sequel tr or of the prequel trilogy, although we never heard about this before, that made it illegal for droids to read Sith out to other people. So he can, he knows what it says, but he's not allowed to tell them anything. Now, of course, some of the Wikipedia nerd ass people out there who are like me might go, well, wait a minute. Wasn't C-3PO like a custom droid? Wasn't he made like, like off the market? Wasn't he literally custom put together by Anakin? That's true, but shut the fuck up. He, of, of course, a, a custom made droid that was built on the outer rim, which is out of the reach of the M of the of the Republic and doesn't follow the Republic laws is going to have a random anti Sith Republic law built in it. So fucking dumb. OK, just fucking stupid. OK, phenomenally stupid. But this means they have to go to another place so now they got the first macguffin and they need to go find a second a, 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 a pseudo macguffin they need to find somebody who can break the sith programming and this is a guy named babu frick lots of people say they like babu frick because he's cute uh i uh fine sure babu frick he is cute it is true babu frick is cute um and babu frick uh, has to do some memory wipe thing. They also introduce another character. Uh, I can't even remember her name. And she is uh, literally just introduced for the not gays. You see, this is the only political part that I can talk about in this entire movie. So God knows I'm going to bring it up. Uh, which is, yeah, her name is Zori Bliss. Thank you. Uh, Zori Bliss. Um... Everybody at the end of The Last Jedi was kind of going, well, hey, um, Finn didn't seem all too into the kiss from Rose, and Finn and Poe have a lot of chemistry, and uh, tons of people were basically going, Finn and Poe are gay, aren't they? They're gonna be boyfriends, right? They have boyfriend energy. Well, see, Disney couldn't have any of that, and so they had to do the not gays. And let me tell you, it is gets offensive, okay? Finn and Poe, the, the two main characters of the series. So they introduce Zori Bliss, who is Poe's ex and is on screen for approximately five minutes. That's it. She appears and disappears almost immediately. But don't worry, she also gives you Another interesting thing, which is another absolute stupidity in this film. She gives him a magical item. This is an item called an Imperial Medallion. Now, if you're a Star Wars fan and you're like, what's a Imperial Medallion? Is it like a, is it like a medal that's given to Imperial people? No, apparently the Imperial Medallion is a uh, a device that allows you to bypass all Imperial security one time. However, and, and I want you to be clear about this. Oh my God, wait, I forgot. Oh my God, I forgot to mention something. Oh shit, I forgot the Chewy thing. Fuck.
I'm gonna have to go back. Oh, we're gonna have to rewind. Oh, shit. Okay, hold on. Hold on, everybody. I'll, I'll do the Imperial Medallion thing. Um, the Imperial Medallion, okay? So, when they were on the Snake Planet, they couldn't escape on the Millennium Falcon. Instead, they had to climb into the 15-year-old crashed ship, which apparently flew perfectly fine, okay? I'm serious. They, they jumped into a scrap vessel and it took off just fine. Not just that, but it just so happens that the Imperial vessel has a button or not the non-imperial vessel. This is not an imperial vessel. This is a a scrap vessel that was owned and operated by a random smuggler. The smuggler vessel has a button on it that opens up a slot that is literally the perfect size of an imperial medallion. So they introduce something that nobody has ever heard of and apparently every ship has a slot for an imperial medallion. I'm literally not kidding you. He pushes a button and a little disc tray with an imperial medallion shape has in it and he puts the medallion in. It makes, it. they just pulled it out of their ass at the last minute. And that was, that was done so that they could make sure that you knew that Poe wasn't gay. Okay. I forgot something, everybody. I forgot something really stupid, okay? Um, at, after they got out of the snake hole, okay? I'm very sorry, this is my apology. I'm issuing an apology, okay? Uh, I'm issuing an apology for this. After they got out of the snake hole, something incredibly stupid happens. They get out of the snake hole, they go to try and fly off the planet in the shitty scrap vessel that I just mentioned. And uh, off screen, even though Chewbacca is literally standing there with them, the pace of this movie is insane and stupid. You literally see Chewbacca and then they turn away to talk and then they look around and Chewbacca has been captured by uh, stormtroopers. I'm not kidding you, to the degree that the camera work is actually fucked up. Um, from the perspective, they do a shot, reverse shot, you should be able to see where Chewbacca is getting kidnapped, but you actually can't until they say Chewbacca's being kidnapped and then they show the shot again and all of a sudden there's two gigantic ships and a whole bunch of stormtroopers and Chewbacca is getting kidnapped. Like, they they actually fuck up the literal camera perspective of the scene. They're standing in a desert. There is no obscuring terrain whatsoever. So Chewie gets kidnapped. And then Kylo Ren shows up, and, and, and Rey and Kylo Ren have a tiny, tiny confrontation. And in this confrontation, Chewie gets blown up! No! No! They blew up Chewie! Oh no! The ship that Chewie's on goes boom! And all, and, he, and he's obliterated, okay? There's nothing left to Chewie. His whole ship got completely blown up! Nothing! It's like literally completely destroyed. There's nothing left. It gets obliterated, okay? And they go, oh no, Chewie! And then they move to the next scene, okay? I'm not kidding you. They're like, no, Chewie, we have to move on. Chewie would have wanted us to go on. And they go, <laughs> and they jump onto it and they fly away. And I'm not kidding you. They fly up into space and it cuts to Chewie being alive. They didn't even let him be dead for five minutes. It's just immediate, almost immediate. It might not be the literal next scene, but it's within two scenes, like less than five minutes of screen time. They just cut to Chewie actually being alive. And you're just like, huh? And you're just left to assume that there was secretly a second ship. And later on, they try to lampshade it because I think it's Poe. Poe is like, there must have been a second ship we didn't see. It's literally the next scene. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I remembered. So Chewie dies and they're like, no, Chewie, we have to move on for Chewie's sake. And then they just cut to a scene of Chewie being alive. Just like I said, 
handing the lightsaber, the lightsaber gets handed back, handing the lightsaber, the lightsaber gets handed back. This entire movie is control C, control Z. Everything in this movie is just control, control C, control Z. Z. Just undo, do, undo. It's beyond pathetic. Yes, I know that, Blaine. The ship that they take was the guy who had the dagger, but it literally was 15 years old and nobody... It, stupid, but yes. Um, isn't it Ray who blew up the ship? Yes, Ray accidentally blows up Chewie, or the not Chewie. She blows up not Chewie with lightning, which is also stupid and doesn't have... Nothing resolves. There's literally nothing that happens. She's like, I can't believe I electrocuted Chewie. And then they're like, no, you didn't. And she's like, I didn't? That's it. Okay, but okay, we have to move on or else it's gonna be forever. This movie's gonna take forever to review, okay? Because what happens next is one of is also unbelievably stupid. Okay? So they use the magical medallion, the medallion that nobody has ever heard of before, that's never been mentioned in Star Wars before, but apparently a 15-year-old scrapper ship has a slot for an Imperial medallion, and they use that medallion to be able to land on the Imperial ship. And let me just point out, the editing in this part, they take off, and they just land. They take off, they push the button and put the medallion in, and then the next shot is them landing on uh, an Imperial ship. There's no tension, there's no, like, None of You know how in every other Star Wars movie ever, the Imperials are like, why is this ship coming closer? You do not have authority. Announce yourself. Who are you? Turn on the tractor beam. Nope, nothing happens. They just fly their ship perfectly into a crowded hangar bay, okay? There's, in the shot, you can see stormtroopers all over the place. You can see the little guards going like this in the droids. They just land a giant junker vessel am amid a bunch of, of, of Imperial vessels, and then they just shoot two guys and nobody stops them. They just go right onto the ship. It is incredibly stupid. Then, uh, they discover, they meet a secret Imperial spy. I don't remember why they did this. Oh yeah, they go to there to rescue Chewie because then they, they find out that Chewie's actually alive. That was the secret. They find out that Chewie's actually secretly alive and, uh, and they're going there to get Chewie back. And while they're there, they're like, oh no, we're not gonna be able to get Chewie. And then they go, and then Admiral Hux shows up. You guys remember Admiral Hux? You guys, you guys, anybody? Anybody re remember Admiral Hux from the other movies? He's like the ultimate Nazi. He's like the turbo Nazi, the ultra racist. Yeah, Admiral Hux, here he is. Or I guess his name is Armitage Hux, this guy. Um. Admiral Hux is like, he has a gun and he's like, <sighs> I'm the rebel spy. Out of nowhere, it turns out that apparently Admiral Hux, after ruthlessly slaughtering and having an unequivocal victory in the last film, decided to become a rebel spy. And he, he chooses to reveal this at that moment when he personally has the entire team at gunpoint. He's like, I'm the Admiral spy. I'm the, I'm the rebel spy. And then he lets Chewie out. And then he's like, okay, shoot me in the leg so they don't know that I'm the spy. And Finn is like, why would you do this? Despite the fact that Finn is also a defector and Finn of all people should supposedly know why someone might defect from the empire. Finn's like, why would you do that, dude? And he's like, grr, cause I hate Kylo Ren so much. And, uh, and, and so they shoot him in the leg and he's like, oh, owie, ooh. And then they run back onto their ship and nobody stops them. J no one stops them. They're in a crowded Imperial hangar in a junker ship. They just stole a guy. The base is on alert and nobody stops them. They just climb onto the ship and fly away. And then, and I'm not kidding you, the literal next scene 
is Admiral Hux talking to General Pride, I think his name is General Pride. Admiral Hux is like, they got away, they shot me and they got away. And then General Pride goes, Heh. and then he turns around and shoots Admiral Hux in the face. I'm, I wish that I was making this up. That's actually what happens. They just, within two minutes of revealing that Admiral Hux is secretly a rebel spy, they shoot him in the face. In this entire time, there has been zero character development for any of the characters because none of the characters have had to make any decisions. None of the characters have faced any dilemmas. It is literally just uh, paste, undo, paste, undo, paste, undo. I was saying control C before, but I meant control V. Control V, control Z, control V, control Z. Paste, undo, paste, undo. The entire movie, okay? But what happens next is possibly the most offensive, maybe, maybe the most offensive, I don't know. Maybe you guys can tell me, okay? By the way, if you all have been enjoying this rage review of Rise of Skywalker, please make sure you like, subscribe to the channel so you can hear the signal. And please tell me your thoughts below, below down in the comments. Please comment your thoughts. Uh, my Star Wars videos are very popular with a niche set of my audience. Uh, they really get, they get boosted into the algorithm if people are willing to comment with their thoughts about the movie. So please consider sharing your comments below as to what you liked, hated, what your least favorite part of the movie is, it means the world to me. Seriously, thank you. There, there's a little bit of a breather, okay? What happens next is very weird, okay? They leave the, uh, they, so, so they've got the MacGuffin, right? They got the knife. The knife couldn't be read because, uh, because C-3PO couldn't, wasn't allowed by his programming to read it. So they had to go to this guy named Babu Frick who would re restart C-3PO so that C-3PO would be able to read the Sith stuff. Well, they do that. So C-3PO tells them what it says on the Sith dagger, and the Sith dagger says, Forest, moon, Endor, dune, desert, planet. Just kidding. It says, Forest, Endor, moon. And so they go uh, to a different Endor. It's not the Endor from the first one, or from the old trilogy. You guys, it, it's close. It's it's similar, but it's not the same one. A lot of people thought that they went back to the actual forest moon of Endor. No, this time they're going to actual Endor. It's confusing and everybody was confused and everybody who saw the movie, even Star Wars nerds were confused. Um, but they go to Endor um, and it tells them to go to Endor. So they're following the instructions on the knife to go to Endor. And when they arrive, um, when they arrive, uh, they land in a random field and they're like, well, what do we do now? And then Ray goes, hold on just a second. And she looks out across the field over to the cliffs and off the cliffs, there is the, uh, the, uh, the, the ruins of the Death Star 2. Remember, there were two Death Stars. So over there is the ruins of the Death Star. Now, I want to remind you, I'm gonna do a little bit of a Bazinga nerd shit because I'm allowed to do that. Let me show you, okay, real quick. I just wanna show you, I'm gonna play this clip, okay? Okay, hold on, hold on. Here, this is the Death Star 2, all right? Watch what happens to the Death Star 2. Okay, there you go. That's what happened to the Death Star 2. It got completely and utterly obliterated. There was no wreckage, okay? It was completely pulverized. It was vaporized instantaneously, okay? Regardless, there is a complete wreckage of the Death Star that is visibly 
like you can see that it's the Death Star, okay? And uh, 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 Flighted Crow, sorry, this is a little bit of a distraction. Flighted Crow says, can I ask what keyboard you use and are the switches lubed? Yes, the switches are lubed. This is a custom keyboard that was made for me by a friend. It is 100% custom. Uh, and yes, the switches are lubed indeed. That's why it sounds so wonderful. Uh, so just wanted to say that I always take an opportunity. My wonderful, wonderful friend Grime Dango made this keyboard just for me with my uh, audio setup in mind. So it's it's very very special. Um, it is a it's based off of I think it uses the Akko two frame. Yeah, it uses the Akko the Akko thirty uh, thirty ninety eight is the frame that it uses. But the switches are custom. So yeah, I'm very proud of it. And thank you to, once again, every single time, we'll always thank Grime Dango for making my amazing keyboard. Um, anyway, back to the movie. Uh, so Ray is land, they land on the field, right? Okay? And Ray goes, what are we supposed to do? And then she thinks for literally 10 seconds. And then she goes, wait a minute. And she looks over at the wreckage of the Death Star and she holds up the knife, okay? And she closes one eye, and she lines the knife up with the wreckage of the Death Star, and then she pulls on a little hidden button that you couldn't see before, and she goes and a little thing comes out of the knife, and there's an arrow that's pointing to a spot on the wreckage of the Death Star. I am not making this up. That is actually in the movie. An ancient knife that was held by some random smuggler that had Sith instructions written on it. They just so happened to land at the perfect vantage point by which you would be able to line up the decaying and falling apart wreckage. And I need you to I need you to uh to to know the planet like that they're on, the wreckage is in an ocean that is constantly producing tsunamis. Literally, when you see the ocean, it is just tsunami wave after tsunami wave. And apparently this ancient Sith knife was perfectly crafted to land up with the crumbling wreckage of the obliterated and vaporized Death Star such that you could point to the exact spot that you're supposed to go. That's not force luck. That's not the force. That is absolute fucking stupidity. It is one of the dumbest things I've, like, I, I couldn't even believe that it was actually in a movie. I've said that so many times. I just, I, I've said, I, I feel like every time I think about this movie, everything is so stupid, I can't even believe it. But, my lovely imps, you will be happy to know that that wasn't, that, that's not anything. The knife is simply pointing you to the second MacGuffin, or the third MacGuffin, the, the second, the 2.5 MacGuffin. That's right. The knife, which was designed to tell you, it's designed to tell you which room an ancient Sith Wayfinder was in. So, Somebody, according to this universe, somebody crafted a knife that was designed to line up with the wreckage to tell you which room in the wreckage the, the, the emperor stored a ancient Sith relic. Just a random one, okay? How did he know what the wreckage was going to look like? Shut the fuck up! Star Wars is why it's Star Wars. That's why that's how he knew that's how this random Sith knife maker knew exactly so that it would point to the room that has an item in it now apparently nobody decided to go explore the wreckage to, to hunt for highly valuable relics except we already know that actually they did because earlier in the film Kylo Ren goes to the wreckage and he also gets a Sith Wayfinder. So as it turns out, there were actually 
two Sith Wayfinders in the wreckage. One of them is pointed to by a knife, and the other one is not pointed to by a knife. And Ra Ka Kylo Ren just happened to get the one that wasn't pointed to by the knife. And here is where one of the weirdest parts in the movie happens. Uh, while they're looking at the wreckage, some random people come up riding on horse goats, okay? Horse goats. Oh, oh, okay, hold on. No, 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 I'm sorry, I have to pause. I have to pause. Everybody in chat saying it rhymes, I have to stop you. I have to stop you because, shing, it's time for me to white knight for George Lucas. George Lucas, literally would never have written a plot this bad. George Lucas actually had ideas that were rejected by Disney that were no way in God damn hell as bad as this crap. This was one of the, no, George Lucas, not even, not even lazy George would have been, would have written something this bad. It might've been cheesy. It might've been stupid. It might've not made any sense in the long run, but it never would have been as dumb as this. So it doesn't rhyme, actually. In fact, there's something definitively unrhymey about this particular bit. I have to defend George Lucas on this because George Lucas never would have fucked that up. Never, he never would have messed it up. <sighs> okay, okay. So people arrive on horse goats and the people who arrive on horse goats, one of them is a woman. And um, um, and immediately uh, Finn takes an interest in the horse goat woman and they're like, we need to repair our ship. And so the horse goat people are like, we'll help you for some reason. And Ray is like, no, I'm taking your boat. And Ray steals their boat and goes to sail out to the wreckage of the Death Star. And wouldn't it be really weird if I told you that this was not only a no gay, this woman, the horse goat woman, but also that possibly even something weirder has happened um, because remember at the beginning of the movie, remember at the beginning of the movie when I told you that there was a line, they're falling into the sand and Finn says, Ray, Ray, I never got to tell you I, I, uh, and then he sinks into the sand. Remember that? What do you think he was supposed to say there? Anybody anybody know any predictions what, what Finn was probably trying to say there? Yeah, thank you, Kit Emporal says, I love you. It's pretty obvious what he was trying to say. And in fact, Poe brings it up two other times throughout the movie. He says, what were you gonna say, what were you gonna say to Ray, huh? And then, and then Finn goes, none of, none of your business, bro, none of your business, okay? There's basically nothing else that would have made any sense. They teased some romance in The Force Awakens. They got rid of it in The Last Jedi, but then they brought it back a little bit. But don't you worry. And this is where it gets, this is where it gets really, really weird, okay? Not only does Finn never actually say, he never, not once in the movie, they actually never address it. They, they have Poe bring it up twice, but they never resolve it. He never says what it was that he meant that he wanted to say. But also, he gets a girlfriend, and she just so happens to be a former stormtrooper too, and she also happens to be black. And I hope you understand what's very strange that's going on right here and right now.
because it's pretty weird to have a character uh, heavily indicate that they're in love with the main character, who's a white woman, and write that out by having them fall in love with a black woman character and also have a character that people theorize is gay also end up getting a girlfriend. What you end up having is a case of no gays and no race mixings, which is why I said this is probably the most offensive thing in the entire series and why this movie is so fucking offensive. You guys remember how I mentioned that all the other movies had like reactionary freakouts? Like a lot of people got super, super mad about there being a woman lead and there being a black lead and there being a Latino lead and all of that stuff. Um, it's a uh, little weird that Disney decided to make sure that uh, not only did they just completely drop this weird idea that Finn would ever love Rey, but also he very visibly and very awkwardly at the last minute uh, perfectly finds a former stormtrooper who talks about how she was basically a slave and they immediately fall in love and they have a, a kiss scene that makes sure that there's nothing offensive in this movie. Oh yeah, they sandbagged the hell out of Rose. Don't worry, I'll talk about that at the end. It was very weird. It was a very weird thing for them to do. I'm not saying that, uh, I'm not saying that it's the only answer is that they were trying to make sure that there wasn't any interracial stuff on the screen. But guys, I talk about politics a lot. I'm quite informed on the history of racial politics in America. And let me tell you something, okay? In America, in the United States, and in, and in many other countries as well, but particularly in the United States, um, a black man being with a white woman is basically the most uh, controversial thing that you could, like, like interracial uh, relationship that you can imagine. There is basically no, in American history, there is basically nothing to the degree that it was a historical moment when, uh, when like, I mean, it was a historical moment in America, an acceptable historical moment when in Star Trek, they had Captain Kirk, who was played by a white man, kiss a black woman. That was what they were willing to put on TV. I don't even, I can't even think of another moment where they had a black man with a white woman as a major cinematic moment, let alone in a Disney series. I'm just saying that Oh yeah, that episode of Star Trek got banned in Alabama? Yes, I'm just, I, I want to be clear. I need you guys to understand that that is a, when I said that these movies are like offensively empty of politics and that this one really is the worst, that's what I'm talking about. That Disney was so cowardly that they realized at the last minute, as far as I can tell, they realized at the last minute that all that they could do was tease the idea that Finn might actually love Rey, and instead they had to write in a character, by the way, she doesn't get any characterization besides saying that she was born as an imperial slave, which, it's just bad, guys. It's just really bad and really fucking pathetic. And I couldn't even, when I saw that, I couldn't even believe that they did that. So it's not just boring, it's also offensive. It's, it's offensive in the way that they caved to racism. They were too afraid to write two of their amazing characters, okay? Listen, I know there's a lot to hate about these movies, but the characters themselves, the individual characters, and especially the actors playing those characters are not the people to be mad at. Disney wrote, explicitly wrote out, they made it impossible, they shut down on a canonical level the idea that two characters that most people thought were gay were gay. Disney basically said, no, 
you're not allowed to have gay canonical characters. And then they also said, no, you're not allowed to have an interracial relationship uh, on screen, even though we hinted at it. It is the cinematic, it, it's it's not not just queer baiting, it's, it's, it's so bad. God, it is so fucking bad. They did, they double did it. No, I'm sorry. People who are saying they did all of this for the Chinese market, it's not just for the Chinese market, okay guys? I'm sorry, I know that it's popular for people to blame China for everything and to blame international audiences for everything. They did it for America too, because I'm sorry, I hate to tell you this, but there are a lot of fucking racists left in America. There are a lot of very angry racists. We talk about them all the time. Did you guys forget the part that I talked about in The Force, uh, the, the Force Awakens where people freaked out because one of the first trailers that dropped happened to have a black man actor playing a lead character? And then, and it caused a conservative meltdown. There are a lot of fucking racists in America. It wasn't just for China. This wasn't done just for China. I'm sorry, guys. That's cope. And also weirdly xenophobic. Like, yes, uh, China is extremely, extremely weird about their media, but this wasn't just for China. Let's move on though. So they introduce the character that Finn immediately falls in love with, who happens to share, who happens to also be black and also happens to be a former stormtrooper. And uh, they just immediately fall in love and he forgets what he was gonna say to Rey completely and it never goes in, never goes into detail on that. Uh, Rey goes and finds the second MacGuffin which is the uh, the Sith Wayfinder. It's a little green triangle. And then she has a fight with uh, Kylo Ren. And this fight is fine. It's kind of lame. It doesn't really have any emotional weight because the movie hasn't made any sense so far. Uh, and so they just fight. And then the healing scene I mentioned before happens. She stabs Kylo feels bad about it and she heals Kylo Ren and then flies away. There's not all that much to it. They whack their lightsabers around and then they move on. Um, and then uh, one of the weirdest things in the entire series happens. Uh, okay. Which is they use the Sith Wayfinder to go to a magical secret planet in the Unknown Realms. That's a new place. Uh, the Unknown Realms, they use the device and they discover Emperor Palpatine's secret planet. Now, there is, a, there is some weird stuff I need to tell you that happens on Emperor Palpatine's secret planet. The first one, is that there is a line slightly earlier in the film that I didn't mention because it wasn't relevant at the time, but I'll mention it now. Kylo Ren walks into Emperor Palpatine's secret planet and he, uh, and the Emperor says, I made you, I made Darth Vader, and I made Supreme Leader Snoke. And when he says that, it pans over a, t a giant, a uh, tube of Emperor Snokes. I'm not like I, like a bunch of Emperor Snokes are just floating in a big cloning tube. Remember Snoke, that guy from that they killed off in the Last Jedi. Apparently, he's like a weird clone, and there's no reason for it. That's all he says. They just show a vat of really crappy looking CGI uh, Emperor Snokes. For what reason? Never said. They never explain it. That just happens. Secondly, the Emperor goes, yes, now my plans are complete. And he lifts his hands up like this. And I kid you not, from underground on his secret planet, um, a bunch of 
star destroyers come up out of the dirt. I'm not kidding you. They go up out of the dirt. And when I'm saying a bunch of star destroyers, I mean hundreds upon hundreds of star destroyers come up out of the dirt. But there's another weird thing, which is that they come out of the dirt fully staffed. So despite the fact that the, the first order is, ha is like a small organization, a diminished form of the empire that does not have as many troops, they've been suffering losses over the past of the last two movies, there is apparently a bunch of buried star destroyers that are fully staffed with red stormtroopers. It's, and let me, can I, can I wonder if I can get a screenshot of this. Um, Cause it looks terrible. Yeah, here we go. I'm gonna get a screenshot of it so I can show you how bad it looks. Um, remember how I said that it, this entire movie is like copy paste undo? Look at this fucking shot, okay? Look at this CGI shot. I just want you to take a look at this and how bad the copy paste job looks. Ready? This is an actual scene. This is the actual scene. They didn't even bother lining them up well. It's actually just copy pasted images of Star Destroyers. Literally thousands is what they say. And they explicitly, yeah, Doe Do says it's so many, it's not even believable. It actually makes it feel faker. If he summoned one Star Destroyer, one Super Star Destroyer from under the ground, it would have been believable. If it was like, my secret plan, and then he lifted like one super big, super badass Star Destroyer, it would have been something. But no, he brings them up. And what's worse, okay, it's about to get even dumber. They then reveal in a line of dialogue that every single one of these Star Destroyers has a miniature Death Star laser on it. Not a joke. Literally not a joke. Every single one of them he summons out of the ground has a, a secret heretofore unknown weapon, a tiny Death Star laser that can destroy a planet. And they're fully staffed. And there's another line of dial dialogue that says that he conjured them, implying not that these were b actually buried under the ground, but actually that he was summoning them, making them with force magic and the people on them, because like I said, they are shown as fully staffed, that he is just creating them out of force energy. Now, some of you nerd emojis out there might know there's actually something like this previously done in the Star Wars series. Uh, hold on, let me see what it's called. Uh, it, I think it's called the Star Forge. The Star Forge. Let me show you this. This is from the Old Republic series, okay? In the Old Republic series, there was a gigantic, and I'm talking like moon-sized superstructure that is ancient technology. It was basically, it vacuumed up the power of a star in order to have robots automatically build robotic ships, okay? It was, they were not, they were fully automated ships. They were robot ships and it was made by robots. And they already had this in the series and they just decided not to use it. Instead of having the final movie just 
borrow the idea of the Star Forge and have it be, oh my God, back in the old, back in the, the, the prequel trilogy, Palpatine secretly built a Star Forge and it's been building Star Destroyers that are fully automated this entire time. And then he can plug them into his brain and control them. They could have just done that and it would have been the almost exact same thing, but it wouldn't have been as stupid. Instead, they just have him summon fully staffed Star Destroyers with Death Star cannons from the ground. This movie is so stupid. I can't even be, I can't, I can't be angry if enough about it. There is basically nothing to like about this movie. It is one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my entire life. And I hope you guys are starting to believe me at this point as to why it's so fucking stupid and offensive. There is no movie with a budget this large that has ever been so fucking stupid. And I know everybody's saying it gets worse. I know it gets worse. Oh, I know it gets worse. It gets so much worse. Because the final, the final conclusion of the film involves them sending out a message um, to, oh God, I didn't even, I forgot about the Leia shit. The really, really, really weird and awkward Leia. I can skip that, forget it. Leia, uh, Leia dies randomly and it's really, really cringy. Um, she gets sad because her son is having a bad time. And for some reason, when her son gets stabbed, she dies. But as we all know, Carrie Fisher was already dead at that point. Like the actress who plays Leia died suddenly and tragically. Um, I, I believe she felt she like died on a plane. Like she fell asleep and never woke up on a plane. Um, so in the movie, they had a few shots of her, but most of them were these weird shots where you don't see her face, you just hear her voice. Um, and uh, for some reason, she she dies in the movie. At, she lays down on a bed and says, I feel a disturbance in the force. And then like 10 minutes later, they cut back to her and she's under a blanket and then she force disappears and the blanket goes for some reason. We have no idea like why uh, that happens. It, it, they just never explain why. They're just like, oh, she couldn't handle the stress of her son or something. We don't know why. I think, it, I think it's supposed to be implied that it's because, uh, because Kylo is on the dark side, but Kylo was already on the dark side and he never stopped being on the, on the dark side. And in fact, at the end of the movie, he goes to the light side. So it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, and Han is a force ghost for some, I don't, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, uh, so the end of the movie, let's talk about the end of the movie that is incredibly stupid. So the end of the movie is the worst battle scene that has ever been in a Star Wars movie. And I mean that it's actually worse than the horrible two, early 2000s era uh, Attack of the Clones CGI. It is truly terrible, okay? Uh, there's a big stupid confrontation with Palpatine. Um, although there is one funny part. There's one funny part that happens, okay? Which is uh, uh, Palpatine, he's like, I will destroy you! Ah! And he absorbs energy from uh, from Rey and, Ky and Kylo Ren. And she, he's like, <sighs> he does the big suck and he sucks up all their energy. And then he goes, yeah! And he shoots a lightning bolt up into the sky and it goes and it makes a vine boom like like he goes like and the the audio in the movie cuts out and a boom goes and it, i'm not even kidding you it, it's so close it made me laugh and he shoots lightning up into the sky 
to electrocute rebel vessels. Oh wait, I forgot about the rebel vessels. God damn it, it's so hard to keep track of this movie. Uh, the rebels send out a, a really encouraging message. They're like, guys, there's still hope. We need help. Come with us right now to this planet that's on the farthest, farthest unknown reaches of the galaxy. Everybody bring your vessels. Oh, can I show you that screenshot too? This this shot is actually in, in infamous. It's infamously bad. Yeah, here we go. Here you go, everybody. People made fun of this a ton and it deserves to be made fun of, okay? So they send out an inspiring message to the galaxy. Uh, yes, I know. Alora says you need to have a Sith Pathfinder to get to the planet, but they just forgot about that. They literally, even though you explicitly need a Sith Pathfinder to be able to navigate to this secret planet on the other side of the universe. Remember how I said that Star Wars doesn't have time anymore? Like that they got rid of time in the uh, in the prequel trilogy? This is a perfect example of it. Because it, it literally like one scene, uh, Poe is like, everybody, all the rebels in the galaxy, come on, we need your help. And the literal next scene is this, okay? I am not kidding you. This is what the rebel fleet at the end of the movie looks like, okay? Oh. Gayfesh says, Gayfesh is offering me a correction. They explained it. They were able to follow the tracker on Luke's old waterlogged X-Wing to navigate the entire fleet. Thank you, I forgot about that. Thank you. They followed the X-Wing. So they all showed up thanks to the inspiring message, okay? It looks like crap. So the big, dumb, stupid battle happens. And let me tell you, there's another stupid thing that happens here. Because for some reason, somebody, for and I know I keep saying for some reason, but that's basically all there is to say about this movie. For some reason, somebody says a line where they're like, uh, the Star Destroyers can't leave the secret Sith planet unless they have a, a, a directional beacon because there's a dark aura around the Sith planet that prevents ships from leaving unless you have the magical beacon. And apparently there's only one beacon and it's on the ground, okay? Now, lots of people have made fun of this because why wouldn't you be able to just fly a giant vessel away from the planet? It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense why that would be the case. They never fully explain it. There's just something that prevents them. So they have a ground-based beacon. There is one ground-based beacon. And so the rebels try to attack the ground-based beacon. And then the Imperials are like, they're attacking our beacon! Which is like the most obvious thing you could possibly imagine obviously, uh, so then they transfer the beacon digitally to one of the Star Destroyers. Not all of the Star Destroyers, just one of the Star Destroyers. Now, I don't know why they didn't transfer it to the other Star Destroyers. They never explain why that's the case. They just digitally transfer the beacon to one of the Star Destroyers, and somehow, Finn literally, I'm not talking, I'm not, I'm not joking. Finn literally goes, he, he like puts his hand on his chin and looks up into the sky and he goes, it's that one. Okay, remember, this is what it looks like, okay? This is what it looks like. And he just goes, it's that one. That's the one. And he points at a random one of the Star Destroyers and somehow Finn knows exactly which one is, 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 tra is sending out the beacon. I'm not kidding you. I'm, you, you guys, I'm not joking. That actually is what happens. He just looks up at the sky and goes, that one, it's that one. And then they all decide to go and do a ground assault on a Star Destroyer. So they fly a single ship, a really crappy looking ship. Uh, they take a, a single ship and they land it through the shields on the Star Destroyer, and they open up the ship, and guess what comes out? It's the goat horses. 
That's right. Remember the goat horses? Remember I told you the cool lady that Finn conveniently falls in love with so that there's no controversy in this film whatsoever? Well, they brought the goat horses. Thank goodness. So they're riding in outer space with no gravity on the top of a ship and they're just riding goat horses on the side of a Star Destroyer that Finn just picked out of the air at random. And keep in mind, they don't, tr the, the Imperials see them coming. The Imperials are like, oh my God, they're coming. And they don't transfer for some reason, even though they've just demonstrated they have the ability to transfer digitally the navigation beacon. They don't move the ship. They don't jump to hyperspace. They don't transfer the beacon. They just stand there and go, oh, 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 literally. They just, it keeps cutting to them going, oh no, the rebels, oh no, the rebels, over and over again. And Finn hijacks a, a turbo laser, I think is what it is. I think he like hacks a, her, a turbo laser and turns it and shoots the, the command bridge. And you see General Pride and he goes, no! And then he blows up. I'm not kidding you, that's it. That's what happens. And, um, and simultaneously to him doing that, uh, Ray and Kylo stab the Emperor. The Emperor's like, you will turn to the dark side. And then Ray goes, no, I won't. And then she just stabs the Emperor. And then he blows the fuck up. And for some reason, uh, Kylo dies just suddenly. They have a kiss and then he dies. I'm, I'm fucking not kidding you. That's actually what happens. They they yell, they stab the Emperor, then then Ray and, and Kylo have a kiss and then Kylo literally goes, huh, and then tips over. It was like a joke. I thought it was, when I, I laughed out loud, Gayfesh can tell you, I literally laughed out loud. Oh wait, oh shit, I got it mixed up. I mixed up, I got it mixed up. I got it mixed up. Ray dies for some reason. I think she gets electrocuted. I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Ray dies from getting electrocuted after killing the Emperor. Okay? And then Kylo uses Force Heal on Ray, and the energy from the Force Heal weakens him so much that they only have time to smooch. And then he goes, Isn't that interesting? And then he kicks, he, he kicks the bucket and tips over. Did I get it there? I think I got it right. I think I got it right this time. Did I remember the order of events there? She gets electrocuted by the Emperor. She kills the Emperor. And then she she's dead. And then he uses the Force Heal. And it weakens him. And she wakes up. And then they have a kiss. And then he tips over dead, right? Gayfesh, tell me if I'm right. I'm sorry, I, I've been pretty good about remembering lots of stuff, but uh, okay, that sounds right, good. I've remembered almost everything. And then, that's it. That's basically the end of the movie. The last shot that you see before the actual end of the movie is, um, oh yeah, he disappears, but that doesn't matter, who gives a shit? Um, who even fucking gives a shit? Uh, the, 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 oh yeah, remember how, remember, wait a second, guys, guys, remember how I said that, uh, there's a huge plot point that says that the Star Destroyers can't leave Exegol because of the, the aura? They're not actually, they, they can't leave the, the eight evil Sith planet because they need the navigation beacon? Well, they blow up all of the Sith ships when the Emperor dies, all of his ships fall apart or they die or something. And then guess what? You see all of the rebel ships just flying away. Even though none of the rebel ships have the beacon. None of the ships have the beacon. They blew up the only ship. They completely obliterated the only ship that had the beacon. And the, the explicit reason for needing the beacon was because once you're at the Sith planet, you can't leave. They show all of the rebel ships flying away. 
And then there's this scene where everybody's going, yeah, oh, woo! We did it, we beat the first order, guys, yeah! And they're all patting each other's backs, and, and then there's a, there's a gay kiss, which was cut out for the, uh, for the um, Chinese version of the film. I will say that. They did cut that part out because they have very strict anti-gay laws in China. Um, and the gay kiss, by the way, is two background characters. Oh, and then the final scene of the movie happens, okay? And this one's really dumb, okay? It's the final scene of the movie. You see it pans down and you see Ray walking through the sand and you're like, oh. you're like, oh, Ray, she went back to Jakku, really? But then you see two stars in the background. Oh, she's not on Jakku, she's on Tatooine. Oh, she went back to Tatooine? And then she walks up, I'm not kidding you, she walks up to the old Lars Moisture Farm from a, from a New Hope. You know the one that got set on fire and there's dead skeletons there? The one that got burnt down by stormtroopers and it's in perfect condition except for some sand and she's like, I guess I'll live here now. Oh yeah, and then she picks up her own lightsaber, apparently, which she makes out of her staff. She's never been there. She has no attachment to that place. She doesn't even know where it is. But get this, then an alien appears. Oh yeah, that's right. An alien appears. And the alien is an old lady. And the alien old lady goes, who are you? And she goes, Ray. And the old lady goes, Ray? Ray who? And she looks directly at the camera and goes, Ray Star Wars. And then he goes, dun, 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 It's actually, she actually says Ray, Ray Skywalker. Wait, did I? <laughs> I forgot to mention, I totally forgot to mention something that's really important. I'm so stupid. Or I was just playing a joke on you. Which one is it? Am I a giga chat or an idiot? I forgot to mention, I forgot to mention that they reveal randomly in the middle of the movie that she's palp that she's a palpatine. <laughs> I forgot. I forgot to tell you guys that. <laughs> she's Emperor Palpatine's granddaughter. They just say it randomly. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm sorry, I failed you. And by that, I mean I've giga chatted you. And by that, I mean I'm a god. Oh, oops. There we go, gotcha, unmuted. Oh. That's it, guys. That's Star Wars uh, Rise of Skywalker, uh, a, a movie that unironically, if you actually want to know what it feels like to have dementia, you should watch Rise of Skywalker. It actually unironically, it's like a dementia simulator. I'm not kidding you. Um, it's a it's sights and sounds that don't make any sense, vaguely familiar shapes um, and and all of it is in the service of making Disney more money while completely ruining any future they have for this particular storyline. 
John Boyega got screwed. Daisy Ridley got screwed. Uh, Oscar Isaacs got screwed. And did I mention... Did I mention Kelly Marie Tran got screwed? Did I mention that? You guys might be going, wait a minute, you didn't say anything about Rose Tico. You didn't say anything about that. You want to know why? Because they basically cut Rose Tico completely out of the movie. Kelly Marie Tran was almost entirely cut from Rise of Skywalker, despite the fact that she was a new main character in uh, The Last Jedi, that she was, like, she put her heart and soul into it. Uh, that was the, I was another little bit of cowardice. I told you I was saving something for the end. This is what I was saving for the end. Because remember how I said that this movie made a bunch of decisions that showed that Disney not only has no spine, but has a disgustingly low level of spine to the degree that they were willing to like write out a, a romance between Poe and Finn and also write out a romance because of Ray, uh, between Ray and Finn, both because it would be politically inconvenient and potentially controversial. Well, guess what? People, uh, uh, when I say people, I mean conservatives. Conservatives did not like Rose Tico. They did not like the Asian woman character in The Last Jedi, and they made such a stink about it that Disney just decided to delete her out of the movie. She does actually have a few lines, but as a complete background character. Uh, 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 Rose Tico's entire character is only ever seen in a single command room, and she has approximately four to five lines in the entire two and a half hour movie, a long movie, a main character got cut out to the degree of having four or five lines in the entire movie. Why? Because a couple of whiny fucking bitch ass conservatives made Disney worried. So they cut her out of the movie, despite the fact that she put her heart and soul into The Last Jedi. Horrible. Fucking pathetic. She didn't do anything wrong. She actually did great. Uh, Kelly Marie Kelly Marie Tran was like a, a fucking fantastic actress. She did a really good job. She didn't do anything wrong. She it, it just goes to show you that fucking meritocracy is false. She didn't do literally anything wrong. They just wrote her out uh, to save face. It's pathetic. Those were the same conservatives that ruthlessly bu bullied K Kelly Marie Tran relentlessly until she disappeared from acting altogether. She doesn't even have social media presence anymore. Yeah, it was brutal. She was a relatively she was a relatively new actress, and she did a really good job. And s a bunch of insane conservatives treated her like shit. So there you have it, everybody. We did it. We made it all the way to the end of the absolute embarrassment that is the Disney sequel trilogy. And it is true, by the way. I've said many times they made a lot of money, but they really put themselves in an awkward position, didn't they? Because where do you go from here? Nobody can, there is no way to build off of this foundation. The, the Force Awakens does not connect directly to the, to the Last Jedi in any conceivable way. And the Last Jedi does not connect to Rise of Skywalker in any meaningful way. And the Rise of Skywalker is so bad and so insane that you can't build off of it at all. There's nowhere to go from this. They can only go backwards or they can just erase that trilogy, erase the sequels and say, we're actually gonna try again, but they're not gonna do that. Disney is, is too prideful. They're never gonna erase their own canon. They're never gonna yield on their own canon that they created. So instead, what? Forever side quills? Forever prequels? They're going forward. There's a Ray movie announced. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Haha, <laughs> but guess what? Where are the writers? Oh no, the Ray movie that's not even finished. It's not even done being written and there's a writer's strike. Oof. Ow. Oh. That's gonna be interesting. 
That's going to be interesting, isn't it? Anyway, to wrap out my insanely long rant, uh, my absolutely unbelievably long rant on uh, Rise of Skywalker, uh, there, there's, there's a reason, and I hope you all understand now why I said that this movie is not only the worst Star Wars movie that has ever been made, it is actually, I unironically mean this, I think it's worse than the Star Wars Christmas special because the Star Wars Christmas special will make you laugh. If you watch the Star Wars Christmas special, you'll be laughing your ass off because it's so weird and looks so bad and the puppetry is so horrible. Um, this movie is worse than that. It is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. It had the most the most monumental budget you can possibly imagine, a budget of nearly half a billion dollars, and all that they could produce was an ugly, horrible looking steaming pile of dimension nonsense. Disney just goes to prove that money doesn't buy talent. You cannot buy your way into a good movie, even if you throw half a billion dollars into it, and you certainly can't buy your way into a, uh, uh, into a, into light, into bottling lightning. You absolutely cannot, and also, as a final note, I just want this to show a vindication to everybody who was mad at me about saying nice things about the prequels. Because the truth is, the prequels were very dumb. And I reamed the prequels where they deserved it. But the cre prequels were able to do something that the sequels could never dream of, which is have a spine, have a heart, and have a soul, okay? The prequels, were not perfect films. In fact, they were very stupid films at times. But the prequels actually did something. They were an artistic venture, even if they were a bungled artistic venture. This, the sequels, but specifically Rise of Skywalker, is shows you what it's like when you when all the life has been sucked out of something and only the intellectual property remains when only the loosest action figures that are shaped like Star Wars remains. This is what you get. You get a hollow, offensive, spineless, boring. The, the sequel pr trilogy is the most boring series of movies to watch ever. I was struggling to stay awake through all three of these films. Okay? They are terrible. Just horrible. And I rest my case. If you've enjoyed my Star Wars reviews so far, if you've been having a good time, if you thought this rant was cathartic and interesting and it made you laugh, smack that subscribe button. And please tell me your thoughts in the comments. Comments mean the world to me. So tell me all your thoughts down in the comments. I'd love to see what you have to say. Plus, you can help make sure lots of people see this video and get to enjoy my uh, unhinged, dementia-ridden rant uh, after viewing Rise of Skywalker, a film with which actively damaged my brain. And I did it for you, folks. So thank you very much, and thank you for watching. Keep listening for the signal.